teacher by trade, um, so please do interrupt me. I'm very used to it. Uh, I teach secondary um, school kids, so I'm very used to 15-year-olds shouting out and you know asking questions and or just disrupting. So please feel free. Okay. Um, so um, obviously the Breed Standard uh, is published by the Kennel Club. Um, and um, we've also got some input from the Breed Council resources um, that are on the website as well. Um, so I'm going to focus mainly on the Breed Standard, but the history of Dachshunds is quite interesting. Um, it means badger hound, um, or tackle as it's referred to in Europe, uh, and it's one of the most distinct breeds of dog. If you ask people on the street um, what they tend to call them sausage dogs, but they know exactly what they look like, short legs, long bodies, um, and they are very, um, you know, there are loads of postcards and things and films and things with Jackson. Um, but they were bred as a hunting hound, uh, and they will still hunt. Um, they very much retain their function, um, and they will hunt um, badger, small prey, big prey if you let them. Um, they are um, quite brave and quite um, keen to hunt at times, um, so they're not always the best off lead. Um, they don't always come back, um, or, um, but some of them, um, particularly this one, would rather be sat on the sofa um, at the moment, I think. Um, but the breed dates back, um, that we know of, to about 1560, and um, Dax and White Dogs were uh, mentioned in many, many early books on hunting. Um, originally they were smooth haired, um, developed by German hunters um, in a combination of French and German hunting hounds uh, in the 15th century, but they were specifically started to be bred as a breed in the 17th century. And other breeds thought to have been involved in the development of Dachshunds are bloodhounds, pincers, terriers, um, the um, Schweißhund or Hanover hound, which is very like the Bavarian mountain hound, um, and the German beaver hunt. And then to get the wires, wirehead terriers, uh, pincers and schnauzers were crossed with the smooth um, to create the wires and then various land and water spaniels to get the longs. Um, and um, we have, if you look at all those different breeds, you can see why we've got such a multitude of colours in the breed. Because if they're all in the ancestry, that's where all these different colours are going to come. And I think of all breeds, they've probably got the widest variety of colours. Um, both in our breed standard and what is not currently in our breed standard. Um, and um, this um, picture here is from 1885. It's a painting by an American um, artist um, and it is titled My Favourite Dachshund and that appears in some books and some um, history. Okay? But we can see there there's obviously other breeds been involved in, in the creation of it. Um, they were bred so that they could go to ground, um, and their confirmation allows that to happen. When I'm going through the breed standard, I'll show you that um, with Margot, um, who is going to ably assist me today, apparently. Um, and the, way, the reason why they're constructed as they are is so that they can go to ground, but also that they can go um, overland all day long if you want them to. They arrived in um, the UK because of Queen Victoria. Um, there's a picture there with her, with one of her um, standard smooths called Dash um, in 1833. And um, the Prince Consort imported a brace direct from Germany in 1840. And Dachshunds weren't actually that popular in Germany at the time, apart from with hunters. Um, and, um, but in the UK, they were developed more as a, a companion dog, as a pet dog um, to have around. Um, and um, because of their royal favour, they became quite popular quite quickly in the UK. And then in the 1870s, they first made their first appearance at a show in Birmingham. And it was in the variety classes. Didn't do very well. Um, and then in uh, Crystal Palace in 1873, they had their first classes and there was an entry of 12 dogs. Um, as I said before, the original one was a standard smooth and the, that's the basis of our breed standard, um, followed by the wires and the long. Um, and you can see in that picture of an early <coughs> long um, that very much the spaniel influence. Okay, you can really clearly see it. Betty, shush. 
um, that there is Spaniel <coughs> influence there. Um, this wire from 1961 is a very famous champion, Gisborne Inca, and um, it was probably used on, on the template of what we want to achieve in terms of construction. Um, and um, whilst there's probably things you could change, the images and things of it freestanding in the ring were very, you know, uh, very spectacular. Um, so, go moving on to the breed standard, uh, which is why, why you're all here. Okay? Um, it's a guideline, as this is, this is the start of all breed standards. It doesn't matter what breed we're talking about. Um, it's a guideline which describes the ideal characteristics, temperament and appearance, including the correct colour of the breed, and ensures that the breed is fit for function, and absolute soundness is essential. Um, breeders and judges should at all times be careful to avoid any obvious conditions or exaggerations which would be detrimental in any way to the health, welfare or soundness of this breed. From time to time certain conditions or exaggerations may be considered to have the potential to affect dogs in some breeds adversely. And judges and breeders are requested to refer to the Breed Watch section of the Kennel Club website for details of any such current conditions, as Ian mentioned before. So whilst you're not going to be assessed on the breed watch, um, we are um, level two, and before you judge, you should be having a look at that to see what um, particular things are affecting the breed. Uh, the main ones are body condition, and rear, back movement, and eye, um, obvious eye issues, or tear eye. Um, if a feature or quality is desirable, so if the breed standard says it's desirable, it should only be present in the right measure. We don't want any exaggeration at all. However, if a dog possesses a feature, characteristic or colour described as undesirable or highly undesirable, it's strongly recommended that it should not be rewarded in the show ring. Okay? Um, we do have some colours described as highly undesirable and some described as unacceptable, which I'll go through when we get to that bit. Um, and, you know, they, they're the sorts of things that you, you should be withholding on if you get them coming onto your shows. Um, I know breed standards are going to be amended to kind of tidy up the wording uh, to make it clearer for everybody, uh, hopefully. Okay, so general appearance, uh, the first section. It's a moderately long uh, in proportion to its height with no exaggeration. And I'm gonna stress some points um, during my talk that I think are really, really key, um, key, or things that people often get wrong when they're judging and they look at the wrong thing. So we don't want any exaggeration at all. Um, they should be a compact, well-muscled body. So whilst they are moderately long, um, their actual body section should be relatively compact and really well muscled, okay? Now, I brought her in deliberately because she's out of coat, okay? She um, is due in season relatively soon, but she's quite good to see um, certain things. So, a relatively compact body um, that is well muscled. Um, with enough ground clearance. Now, when we're talking about black ground clearance, we're talking about a bit of daylight underneath them. We don't want them on the ground at all. Um, and we want um, the ground clearance of not less than one quarter of the height at the withers uh, to allow for free movement. And that's really important. If you think these dogs are going to go through rough terrain, and if they've got their chests on the ground, they're not going to do that. They're going to be damaging this bit underneath, which is important. So you want about 25% of the height underneath them, okay? Now, on heavily coated long heads, you need to get your hands under and just see how much there is. Because some of them with, with long, really long coats, it can be quite deceiving until you put your hands underneath, okay? Um, the height at the withers, which is here, should be half the height of the length of the body. And we measure that from the point of breastbone to the rear of the thigh. And that's important. It isn't from the point of shoulder, it's from the point of the breastbone, which is here, to the rear of the thigh, which is here. And again, in a long head, you need to move your coat out of the way, okay? You need to actually get your hands and have a look. And if she's going to, are you going to cooperate? Oh yeah, okay. So, um, it is quite um, interesting to do that 
because um, a lot of dogs don't actually meet this two to one criteria. Um, a lot of dogs in the UK are too long for their height, basically. Okay. Um, I have got a tape measure with me. Um, I'm more than happy for you to use the tape measure on my dogs. Um, she is um, in um, old measurements, 20 inches long, and she is 10 inches tall. Okay, so um, she is actually about the right proportions. If you get ones with great big prosternums in front, then you have to take that into account, um, and that often um, does affect the proportions. Um, but you can see here on our diagram, we want this two to one uh, ratio. The orange line here, okay, it's the same length as this orange line here, and if my animations work, we should be able to see that it, that dog there in that picture is exactly two to one. Um, we want a bold, defiant carriage of head and an intelligent expression. So when they are walking around and when they are sat, we want them to be holding their heads um, up and slightly forward. We want them a proud head carriage, um, and they should look intelligent. Did you get the notice? They're meant to look intelligent. Okay. <laughs> She's starting to use her ears a little bit, so that's fine. Um, so here's some pictures. These have been photoshopped. Okay, so these are not, this is the same dog and I photoshopped them. So the one at the top is the correct proportion. Um, this one, obviously, is too long, okay? And this one would be slightly too short. It's a bit harder to, to squash the picture up. Um, and if you can get, try and start getting your eye in, okay? Which box do we think is the correct two to one proportions? Anyone want to be brave? Okay, so that is the correct two to one proportion. Um, B is 1.7 to 1, uh, C is 1.8, and D is too long. Okay, and um, we do see quite a lot of um, dachshunds in the UK that are too long. Uh, these are pictures of my past dogs. Okay, uh, I'm more than happy for anyone to criticise them. This was a young puppy. Um, and it doesn't help the girl behind him has got um, black uh, trousers on, but he is two to one. Um, this bitch here, um, I've actually got her daughter in here, um, but she is also two to one. And again, you need to think about the coat, okay? So you need to go through the coat. Um, and then these other two, um, the standard long bitch is uh, slightly too long, okay? And uh, this is one of my mini longs, and she was too long. She was too long at all. I'm not sure whether she was too long or whether she was actually just too low. Probably too low, because she didn't have any ground clearance either. Um, okay. This is not a very good image, um, but of a dog that um, is too short. So okay? we would not want to see that in the ring either. lies beneath the skin. What do we actually mean in terms of their construction? So they are intelligent, they are lively, um, and they are courageous to the point of rashness. Okay? At sometimes that comes across as stupidity. Okay? Uh, they will tackle things way larger than themselves. Um, this one flies up the stairs, comes halfway down and launches herself half from halfway down the stairs because she thinks I'm going to catch her. Um, yes, you do. Um, so they are, at times, they, they will do things without thinking about it because they are so rash. Um, they're meant to be relatively obedient. Um, meant to be. Um, they're especially suited to going to ground because of their low build. Um, they have very strong four quarters and four legs. Um, their, front, their fronts are um, really strong and they are designed so that they can dig um, and the way the legs are, that they push the soil back past them, themselves, okay? Um, they have a long, strong jaw, um, and immense power of bite and hold. If, you, if any of you have got dachshunds and they have caught anything, um, you will know sometimes how difficult it is to get it off them. Um, they do have relatively big teeth for the size of the dog, okay? And they do have a really strong bite. Okay, if they if they want to bite, they you know they will do. Um, 
They have an excellent nose, so they will sniff anything out. Um, they are a persevering hunter and tracker, that's why they don't want to come back when they're off lead, because they will just run off. And it is essential that functional build, size and proportions ensure working ability. Okay, these dogs should be able to do a day's work, even if we don't want them to. Okay? Um, so they should be well muscled, they should have, um, you know, the confirmation is there so that they can do their, their job of work. Um, they are really faithful, they love their own humans, okay, they um, prefer, often prefer their own humans to strangers. Um, they're really versatile, they'll turn the hand to anything, any, any um, job that you ask them to do, so if you want them to sit on the sofa, they'll sit on the sofa. If you want, oh, if you want yours to um, go um, for ten mile walks every day, they'll do that. If you want them to be um, show dogs, they'll do that. If you want them to be hunters or, or do man trailing or um, anything else like that, they will do. Uh, she's just started doing agility with my niece. Um, I'm going to um, Young Kennel Club camp with her, and she was like, oh, "Which dog can I do agility with?" Well, it's going to be this one that jumps off the sofa and jumps on the windowsill. Uh, and they're generally good tempered, okay, but particularly so with their owners, with the people that they know. Um, they can sometimes be a little bit standoffish until they get to know you. Um, so the head. Um, the head is long and it appears conical, that's cone shaped, okay, so we want a cone. It doesn't matter what that cone is like, okay, as long as it is cone shaped, alright. Um, when seen from above. Uh, when seen from the side, it should taper uniformly um, to the tip of the nose. And you can see there it tapers down to her nose. And the skull should be only slightly arched. We don't want a domed skull. We don't want a flat skull. We want a slight arch in the skull. It says here, neither too broad nor too narrow. Okay? So that is where it's down to your interpretation of what you think is neither too broad nor too narrow. Okay? Um, we don't want big wide spaniel heads um, and we don't want thin snipey heads, but it's your interpretation of what you would say is neither too wide nor too narrow. Um, it should slope gradually without a prominent stop. And the, you know, the breed standard clearly says without a prominent stop. So you don't want a big break here, and particularly with some that do have more of a spaniel head, you do sometimes get quite a, quite a defined stop, and we certainly don't want that. Uh, into a slightly arched muzzle. Now, some have uh, more of a sit up, okay, more of an arch on their muzzle. We don't see it so much now. Um, we used um, some. Um, Standalongs um, in other countries do have more of a, uh, an arch on the nose, on the muzzle, but um, it says slightly arched, so that's... Uh, and the length from the tip of the nose to the eyes is equal from the length from the eyes to the occiput. So, from here to here should be the same as here to here. Okay, so the occiput is this point at the back, little bony protrusion. And from there to there should be the same as the muzzle. Okay, so that's something for you to check when you do. In the wire hairs, particularly, um, we get some ridges above the eyes here, where she's got her tan spots, um, which um, are um, more prominent in the appearance of a slightly broader skull. But it's an appearance; it isn't actually a broader skull. It just looks like that visually. Um, lips closely fitting, neatly covering the lower jaw. If you think they're out hunting, potentially hunting badgers and things like that that could attack them, you don't want great long flues that can, they can um, grab hold of. You want tightly fitting lips. Here's some pictures of dogs that I think have got nice heads. Um, and um, we've got some smooths, um, a mini wire and uh, a sand long. And you can see there all the, the points I was trying to make. So none of them have got a prominent stop, but you can see on this mini wire, you've got these prominent um, sort of eyebrows okay, that make it um, very characteristically white. Okay? 
Um, and you can see here on this boy, um, he's got a slight arch on his nose. Okay. And, okay. Please do stop me if you want to ask any questions at any point. Okay. So, eyes. Um, we want medium sized, almond shaped, and set obliquely. Okay, so we don't want um, big round eyes or anything like that. We certainly don't want them to be looking like they're popping out of school at you. Uh, and we want them set obliquely. They should be dark, except in chocolates where they can be lighter. Um, and in dapples, one or both wall eyes is permissible. A wall eye is where um, the dapple gene has, has hit the eye pigment as well, and you get like a blue eye or partially blue eye. Um, dogs can see perfectly well out of them, it's just a visual uh, appearance. Uh, so you want nice dark eyes, um, light eyes stand out of mine, and it's just not characteristic. The ears should be set high and not too far forward. They should be broad, of moderate length, and well-rounded. Okay, so you can see here on these pictures, well-rounded at the base, set reasonably high, okay, both of them are set reasonably high, and the key thing that they are not pointed or folded, that is important. Okay, on a long hair, particularly one with lots of coat, and uh, she's not got a huge amount of coat, but you can see um, the ends of the ears are rounded and you don't want them to be folded over. It's not too much of a problem, to be honest, um, in the breed. When they're alert, the forward edge should touch the cheek, like it is doing here and here, uh, and they should be mobile, and when at attention, the back of the ear is directed forward and outward. She probably won't do it, um, because they tend to be, you know, particularly show dogs, they're so used to um, just accepting what we do with them that they don't, um, show their alertness very much, do you? What? No. Um, but certainly if something grabbed her attention, if a squirrel ran, her ears would come up immediately. Okay. Uh, the mouth. Okay, I talked a little bit about the mouth before, and because they're meant to have this um, strong, powerful jaw, um, we want a perfect, regular scissor bite. Um, and you should be checking the teeth, um, that they are all there. So it says teeth strongly developed, powerful canine teeth fitting closely, jaws strong with a perfect regular and complete scissor bite. And a scissor bite, just in case anyone's not aware, um, where the upper teeth closely overlap the lower teeth and they're set square to the jaws. You do see some where they're not set square to the jaws and you should be looking for that and checking for it. And it says complete dentition important. A dog should have 42 teeth. Um, they, uh, and it is absolutely fine to look back and really check that they have got full dentition. The ones that tend to be missing, um, and we would probably not worry too much, is P1, which is this little one here just behind um, the canine teeth. But um, please do check teeth um, and um, you know, you don't want to be there for ages counting, but don't just look at the bite at the front, okay? Um, do check down the sides that they've got um, full dentition. <coughs> the neck. Uh, long, muscular, clean, with no dewlap, slightly arched, running into graceful lines into the shoulders, and carried proudly forward. That is not upright, okay? <laughs> So when they are being moved, uh, particularly some handlers who decide to string them up, um, will string them up and they will move with their necks at right angles. Good girl. And that is not what you want to see because that doesn't show the graceful line into the shoulder. They should ideally be able to be moved on a looser lead and when they're moving their heads should come forward slightly. Okay. Um, because it should flow into a graceful line. She's typically going to throw her head backwards now because she's wondering what I'm doing. Um, but you want them to be able, um, you want this long neck to flow into the shoulders. Okay? Um, and it is important that it's carried proudly forward. Uh, they are sent out, they do stick the noses on the ground, 
Um, so it's getting that balance between keeping the heads up but not stringing them up so they're, uh, you know, got this right angle because that's not good. Um, okay, four quarters, very wordy in the breed standard. Our breed standard is very wordy compared to other, some other breeds, um, but the front is important, okay? Uh, shoulder blades long, broad, and placed firmly and obliquely, 45 degrees to the horizontal. So here's her um, top of her shoulder blade, and here's the point of the shoulder, and that should be at 45 degrees to the horizontal. Okay? Um, upon a robust rib cage. Okay, we don't want that size or anything like that. And the upper arm should be the same length as the shoulder blades. Good luck if you find it. Okay? <laughs> but it should be. So we've got our shoulder blade here. And then the upper arm is this bone here, and it should be the same length. So that if you dropped a line from the top of the shoulder blade, it should go to the back, um, to the elbow, okay? And it should be um, straight down. Um, that is what we're all striving to get, a longer upper arm, okay? Um, but it should be the same length. And it should be at 90 degrees. So we've got our shoulder blade at 45 degrees to horizontal and our upper arm forming a right angle here to here, okay? So it's quite straightforward to work out the front um, angulation. Um, and it should be covered with hard, supple muscles. Um, and this upper arm needs to be really strong. If you think what the dog is meant to do, okay? You, they've got to be able to squash this front construction so they can get in the hole, okay? So they can get down. But they also need to be able to dig to get the soil out of the way. And when they're coming out again, they need to be able to shuffle backwards and, and get themselves out. So it is very mobile, okay? Um, and because of those, um, I guess, fairly extreme angles compared to some breeds, um, you can, they can do that. Um, the forearm is short and strong in bone. Okay. Um, and it should incline inwards, forming a slight crook. Good girl. I know, I'm going to make you balance. Okay, the slight crook is here. Okay, she will let you see it quite easily. Um, and that fits nicely around the chest. So the chest is um, it's oval in front, and this crook should fit nicely around that front. Okay, good girl. Um, the forearm is moderately straight, it must not bend forward or knuckle over. What we mean by knuckling over is when they, I don't even think she's going to do it, but it's when they, um, they knuckle over like, no, she, won't, she, she can't do it, which is a good thing. Um, but they knuckle over in front and um, we don't see that too much, but you, can, you do see it sometimes. Um, and that indicates unsoundness. And the correctly placed foreleg, when they're stood, and this doesn't matter if they're stood and stacked by the handler or if they're just standing naturally on their own, should cover the lowest point of the keel. So again, with the long head, you need to get the coat out of the way and have a look. But the lowest point of the keel is here, so this front leg needs to be covering that lowest part when they're stood naturally. If it's too far in front, Okay, that indicates that there's not enough upper arm, um, so that it's not in the right place. Okay, um, and it just might indicate that the whole front construction isn't set where it should be. Um, and again, it mentions ground clearance, never less than one quarter of the height at the withers. Okay, so they, we do need this ground clearance for them to be able to work. Is there any questions on anything so far? Can you just, can you just, um, for the purpose of definition, just can you just show us on the diagram the, the keel because it's, it's a, it's, a, it's. A, right. I, I, if you, if you could just. It's on, it's here. It's the lowest point uh, underneath. It's not the easiest um, diagram to show it on. Um, if I go back. Just see if you get. Here. Yeah. Okay. So here, this. Fall leg is covering the lowest part, so it's where the rib cage is at its lowest. That's, that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's okay. 
I thought, you know, I wasn't sure. I, I thought it was, but it, it was not. Yeah. Right. Right. And we've got some pictures here. This, these are in your handout in the extended version, so please do have a look at them. I'm not going to labour over what is right and what is wrong because your exam is on the Breed Standard, and I don't want to confuse any of them. So, as I said before, it's, if you can see in this picture, although this is an artist's image, this front construction is designed so that it can get in and get underground. Um, and it, that's really important. And the rear angulation is the same. Okay, the body. Moderately long, full muscled, uh, sloping shoulders, back reasonably level, down to your interpretation of what you would say is reasonably level. Uh, we certainly don't want any tabletops, um, that is not what we want at all. Um, blending harmoniously between the withers, which is here, and a slightly arched loin. Now the loin is this section here, and you want it, it says slightly arched loin. That is more obvious when they're moving. Okay. So when they're stood, they relax and, and, and everything should be um, reasonably level. But when they're moving, you will see that top line uh, fluctuate and it's then that you'd see the slightly arched loin. And that's important, they're going to be working all day, they're going to be trotting along. And if this uh, loin isn't capable of arching slightly, it's not going to be an economic um, movement and they're not going to be able to keep going all day. The withers and the quarters of approximately the same height. So, you want the withers and the quarters to be roughly the same height. Um, bitches, when they're coming in season, do tend to stick the bums in the air a little bit um, and sometimes rise slightly at, um, to the back end. But you want them to be roughly the same. Okay? Um, equally, we don't want to see ski slope top lines where the withers are much higher than the back end, um, which in some varieties is becoming a little bit of a trend, unfortunately, and we don't want that. Um, the loin is, as I said before, is short and strong, and the breastbone, now, the breastbone is an important feature of a dachshund, this bit here, okay? Um, and you need to be checking this when you're judging, okay? The breastbone should be strong and so prominent that a depression appears on either side. Now obviously on a smooth it's easier to see, but when you put your hands on you can feel this depression on either side of the breastbone. Um, different people in the breed from years ago might call it slightly different words, but the breed standard calls it a depression, but that is the term we use. Okay? Um, and when viewed from the front, the thorax should be full and oval. Okay, so hopefully you can all see it there. Uh, they should have an oval <coughs> front. Okay, and when viewed from the side or above, it should be full volumed. So you don't want slab sides or, or anything like that. It should be nice and full. They're going to work all day. They need plenty of heart and lung room to be able to do that. Um, so allowing, um, by its ample capacity, complete development of the heart and lungs. Ribs extending well back, uh, with good length of sternum. So when you, again, when you're judging, check underneath that the sternum is coming well back. Okay, that is something that she could be slightly better on, because um, she is slightly long in loin. Okay, good girl, all right. Um, but do check where the sternum do to check where the sternum finishes when you're judging. Um, underline gradually merging into the line of the abdomen, so we don't want great tuck up. Um, we don't want saggy bellies either, um, we just want it blending in. Uh, and the body sufficiently clear of the ground to allow free movement. I think that's about the third or fourth time that has been mentioned, okay? And that is important. Hindquarters. Let's turn it around. The rump full, okay, broad, uh, strong, with pl 
pliant muscles. The croup, which is this section here, okay, should be long, um, full, robustly muscled, only slightly sloping towards the tail. Uh, and the pelvis is strong and set obliquely and not too short. So we've got our, um, our pelvis in here. Now, if they don't have the right shaped pelvis and it's not set obliquely, they can't be moving their back ends to allow them to get to ground. They don't have the correct movements, so they're not driving from behind when they're moving. And also, they're more likely to have open problems. Uh, so you want a nice, obliquely set um, pelvis that's strong and not too short. Um, and that, um, the, if the pelvis is right in the right angle, that gives you this long croup, okay, and that is important. Um, upper thigh set at right angles to the pelvis, so our upper thigh is here, okay, and that is at right angles to our pelvis, which is about here, okay, um, and it's strong and of good length. So you want this upper thigh to be quite a good length. The lower thigh is short. So here's, my, here's her lower thigh from here to here to the point of hock. And in comparison to the upper thigh, you want it to be slightly shorter. Uh, some do get great long second thighs and give quite exaggerated hind movement uh, because of that. They have to be run because otherwise they can't get it out of the way. Um, and that's not correct. We don't want that. We want a short second thigh. Uh, or lower thigh, sorry. Uh, and again, that is at right angles to the upper thigh and well muscled. So when they're stood, you've got your oblique pelvis, you've got your upper thigh at right angles, you've then got your second thigh at right angles, and you get that um, angulation there at the back end, um, which is um, characteristic. Um, of a lot of shorter legged breeds. Okay, let me get that. Um, when viewed from the rear, the hind leg should be straight and parallel and neither close nor wide apart. So, you should be able to plonk them down without placing them too much and ideally they should be straight and they should be able to stand with their back hind legs the same width as their hips down, okay? We don't want cow hocks or um, them sticking out. We want them to fairly naturally stand with their back legs parallel with a good amount of width between, okay? And again, long hairs, please move your coat out the way to have a look. Um, and um, it's quite good to look at them when they've just set themselves up freestanding because um, a lot of handlers are very good at making sure they're stood correctly. Okay. Um, feet. Front feet should be full, broad, deep, close-knit, straight or very slightly turned out. Hind feet are smaller and narrower and the toes are close together with a decided arch to each toe. Strong, regularly placed nails with thick and firm pads. These dogs have got to work all day. They're on their feet all day across rough terrain. So they've got to have these thick pads, otherwise uh, they're going to damage their feet and they're going to get cuts and things like that. And the dog must stand true, with, um, which is equally with all parts on the foot. But these thick and firm pads are really important. Now, when you, if you look at her, she's not got the best feet, okay? Um, she could do with thicker um, pads. They're okay, but I would like um, a better foot on her, if I'm being really critical. A back feet are probably better than a front feet. But when you're looking at the different um, examples of the dogs, please do have a look at the variants um, in their feet, okay? Some varieties have better feet than other varieties, um, but it should be, it should be something that people should know. But key thing, thick and firm pads, and regularly placed nails. Um, and again, it relates back to the function. Okay, everything in the breed standard relates back to what they are designed to do. Um, tail, continuous line of the spine, but slightly.
slightly curved, without kinks or twists. Our breed standard specifically says no kinks or twists, therefore we should be checking that they don't have kinks or twists. The tail is a continuation of the spine, and if you've got kinks or twists in the tail, that is an, an indication that there's something not right with part of the spine. Okay, and in a breed um, where we do have some problems um, with their backs, that is something that we should be checking. So when you're checking a tail, please do start at the top and go down. Um, you can either just run your fingers down, um, but if you've got one that's particularly heavily coated, he's quite a good example because he's got lots of feathering on his tail. Just, just feel each vertebra and make sure there's no kinks and twists in there. Um, it's harder to hide it in a, in a smooth, um, but in longs particularly, you do need to actually feel. Um, and when they're moving, it should not be carried above the top line, um, and it shouldn't ideally touch the ground when at rest. Now, that's fine. Apart from the feathering on a long head is obviously going to touch the ground. That isn't actually the tail that's touching the ground. But we don't worry overly about length of tail. It's more that it's correct. Okay. Um, when they're moving, they shouldn't carry it up. Some will be happy and wagging their tail. Our standard bitch, when we get her out, you'll see she is a very happy girl. Um, and she will um, carry her tail out, but it doesn't... It's not stuck straight up, okay? So the tail set is still correct, and she just carries it happily, okay? Well, now she's using rings because of the streets. <laughs> okay, gait and the movement. It should be free and flowing. It should have a long stride, and the drive comes from these hindquarters that are really well muscled, okay? So the drive comes from the hindquarters when viewed from the side. When viewed from in front or behind, the legs and feet should move parallel to each other, with the distance apart being the width of the shoulder and the hip joints respectively. Okay? It's fairly straightforward. When they're moving, they need to move with their front nice and parallel, okay? and the same at the back end. If they are built right, you will see their pads and you will see them kicking backwards. Okay? Um, and if you, if they're not built right and there's something wrong, often with the length of the second thigh, okay, they will either run with a very exaggerated kicking where they kick back too much, or they will tummy tap and their back leg never goes beyond um, the vertical. They do this sort of movement, which is um, not uncommon, so please do look for it. Now hopefully, uh, here's some pictures of and some dogs moving, some of mine and one of uh, the seats. Um, and you can see here that even though these are uh, photographs, okay, they're not actually moving, you can see that the drive is coming from behind. Okay? Um, you can see that they are pushing back and really propelling themselves forward. And this is a lovely shot to show the parallel hind action with the correct width um, behind. Uh, and whilst this bitch here is a different type, um, you can still see that she is uh, using her back end and really uh, propelling herself forward. Uh, hopefully, on the next one, this video should work, which shows you exactly front and back movement, okay? Um, let me just press play. And hope the sound's off. Okay, now this is not a UK dog. This is a video on Facebook, on YouTube, which when you look, you can see really clearly, when the camera's in the right place, that this dog has absolutely parallel front, and when you see him going away, back movement as well, okay? And I thought that was a really nice um, video to illustrate that width of the hip joints and the shoulders, respectively. Okay, it's absolutely as good as you're going to get. You're not going to get a better video, a better um, movement than that on any dog. Okay, now the coats. This is where I may need some uh, other varieties to show some points. Okay, 
So, the wires, with the exception of the jaw, eyebrows, chin and ears, the whole body should be covered with a short, straight, harsh coat, with a dense undercoat, beard on the chin, eyebrows bushy, but hair on the ears is almost smooth, and the legs and feet will be well, but neatly furnished with a harsh coat. And you should be checking the harshness of the coat, not on the body, okay? Yeah, if you don't mind yeah. saying. So. Yeah. And then the coat on the long hairs, uh, soft and straight, 
or only slightly waved. Longest under the neck. Um, soft and straight or only slightly waved. Longest under the neck, on under parts of the body and behind the legs where it forms abundant feathering. Um, and on tail where it forms a flag. Um, the outside of the ears are well feathered, but the coat should be flat and not obscuring the outline. Now, this is a young male, um, he carries a big coat, but you can see that he, his out, you can still see his outline, um, but he does have abundant feathering, and he will probably get more, he's only just over 12 months old, sand. Um, and his tail, is very definitely a flag and that is completely untrimmed. Um, let's just brush, just brush through. Good boy. Um, the bitch I have out before, which I'll just pop her back on the table. Um, she's still got plenty of hope for a bitch, okay? Um, in fact, I prefer them all to have this little this amount of coat. You don't want them to have too much stand. Um, you can see here feathering on the back of the legs, um, feathering at the back end, and even though she's got less tail, she's still got a flag on her tail. Okay, and you can see here that her ears are covered um, with um, feathering. But you want a nice flat coat. She has got, I think, the best coat I've ever owned. Um, in that she is washed. She dries in the sun, that is what she's like. It's flat, it's straight, um, and it never flicks anywhere, okay? My other bitch that you will see later on who's in the trolley, she does not have the flat coat that we would want, okay? Uh, and she is a lot of hard work. Um, the sand long bitch that we've got, who is whinging and boning, She also has a really good coat. She's got quite a lot of coat, but again, <laughs> um, she's you know it doesn't obscure her outline. Okay, she's got um, plenty. No, she's got plenty, but it doesn't. Um, it's not obscuring her outline at all. Okay. Helen, can I just yes. ask? Can you have too much of a flag? Um, well, um, it says it just forms a flag. Um, it says um, too much hair on the feet is undesirable and you need it not obscuring the outline. A flag is not going to obscure the outline. Um, but um, certainly some that have great long um, tail feathering often indicates they've probably got too much elsewhere as well. Um, and maybe they've got a bit, you know, a bit too much. Um, but it's probably more of a housekeeping issue that they're going to pick up all the bits and sticks. And if you think that they are meant to be working, even if they're long hairs, and they're going through a forest, they're just going to pick loads of rubbish and brambles and things up. Um, and therefore, um, they're going to um, get too much stuck um, in, her, in their tails because the coat will pick up brambles and things quite easily. Um, you will find ones that do work, have less coat because it gets pulled uh, and it just gets naturally uh, pulled out as they're working. Yeah. Okay, any questions about the coats? No? Okay, so the key thing with the wires is that it's a harsh coat with a smooth that the hair is um, short and smooth, but on the underside of the tail it is feel, does feel coarse. And with the long, that the coat is flat and not obscuring the outline. Yeah, it doesn't mention it, um, but 
you do certainly have to strip the tails as, as well as um, everywhere else. So he's, he's got quite a thick tail naturally, so I have to say, if I was showing him, take a lot of hair off it. Yeah, so you just strip it so that it's, it's the same as the body coat, yeah. Um, you do see some that lose some of the hair, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. chocolate boys lost it. So yes. They will lose like patches here. And um, some of them have much thinner tails. Yes. Yeah. It depends which country they come from. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very working -y. Yeah, it's a very good type. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He says you've got a witch coming in season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
Okay. Um, size, standards, ideal weight 20 to 26 pounds or 9 to 12 kilograms. Miniatures, ideal weight 4.5 kilograms or 10 pounds. The desired maximum weight for a miniature is 5 kilograms or 11 pounds. Um, we do obviously weigh the miniatures at the majority of shows. Um, it is a desired maximum, um, so that is down to the judge to judge how much you are prepared to um, tolerate either side. But the key thing, and this obviously links to breed watch on body condition, exhibits which appear thin and undernourished, undernourished should be severely penalised. So if they are, doesn't matter what the scales say, if they are thin, you should be severely penalising them. Um, far more than if it was over the desired maximum weight. Okay, If it was thin and nine pounds, it's still thin and that is a, a concern. Okay. Um, and then, yeah. Sorry. Um, is the, obviously the standard is an ideal weight of 20 to 26, I'm sorry, I'm not passionate about 20 to Yeah, that's fine. Um, um, and then, obviously the miniatures, it says, again, ideal weight 10 pounds. Then, is the desired maximum weight in there of 11 pounds to indicate to judges that it, if they're a bit over it, I mean, what, can you explain that? Why that's there? Um, so, it used to be, if they were 11 pounds or over, no, yeah. we wouldn't accept it, mm. okay? And when I started showing minis, if it was 11 pounds and a quarter ounce, you might as well take your dog out of the ring, okay? In fact, some judges would send you from the ring. Mm. Um, but, um, this was changed, um, i trying to think when it was changed. 2009. 2009, um, to be a desired maximum. Um, so that there was that flexibility that judges could still reward dogs that were slightly over, um, and rather than send them from the ring. Okay. okay? Now, how much over you are prepared to accept is down to your personal preference when you are judging. Okay? Um, in an ideal world, it would be great if all the miniatures were below the desired maximum. It used to be. They used to be. The yeah. ones that were shown used to be. <laughs> um, so well, you have to breed for yeah, the size and weight. Yeah. And it is it is one of those things, you know, if you've got your whole entry and your best best constructed dog uh, is over the weight, but it's still the best that means the fit to function. Do you penalise it because it's overweight and put up a, a worse constructed dog, or do you just judge it as one fault, like all the other points of the breed standard, because it is only one point of the breed standard? Um, and that is down to judges' individual preference. It, it must be a challenge for, for readers because muscle is, is, is considerably heavier than, than, than fat. You know, and, and, and if you get a really muscled dog, and you know. And I think what has also happened is because a lot of breeders have focused on getting the proportions right, the two to one proportions, and getting the ground clearance, some of that comes with a slightly <coughs> bigger frame dog, um, and they need to then consider about breeding down uh, and, and getting smaller ones again. Um, and um, but you, it's down to judges' um, interpretation, and if it says you know it's the desired maximum, it doesn't mean it's a fixed maximum. Okay, it's just what we should be aiming for. Um, but equally, there's no differential between dogs and bitches. Um, so if you're wanting your dogs to meet that, then really perhaps your bitches should be smaller. But if you've got bitches at that, that weight, naturally, in, in all breeds, your dogs are going to be bigger. Um, so you need to interpret that um, yourself. How, do I just, but how far over weight would you consider not acceptable? It's down to individual judges. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some will accept a lot more than others. Mm -hmm. Obviously at the moment um, we have a mix between some shows are weighing and some shows aren't weighing. Um, and some judges, even if they're not weighing, can still judge what is roughly 11 pounds. Um, and that's fine. Um, but 
you know, it is its personal preference and what you prioritise in terms of the breed standard over other things. Can I just ask then, are, would a dog be penalised for being under the weight? L not thin, but under the weight? Right, so it shouldn't be, okay? The bottom line is it shouldn't be. And particularly if you have males at 11 pounds, a bitch at 9 pounds should be perfectly acceptable, okay? Um, however, comments are made to exhibitors, I'd like a bit more of them. And that is a real shame. Um, I mean, my very first mini long 23 years ago now, she was 10 pounds, absolutely perfect. But the number of judges who said, just like a bit more of her. And I used to be thinking, Wow. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, and that was 20 odd years ago. Yeah. Because um, everything else in the class is too big. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Cor yeah. the correct yeah. sized ones. Exactly. Yeah. So don't, yeah. you know, and even and in the standards, yeah. you know, 20 to 26 pounds mm. in some varieties, if you get a, stand, a male that is 26 pounds, it will look very small against the others. Very small. Um, so, if you are a judge who is going to stick rigidly to the miniature um, weight, you need to also be sticking to the standards as well. We don't weigh them, but um, 20 to 26 pounds is a lot smaller than the majority of them. I don't think there is one, isn't there? there is. <laughs> I mean, you, that's where you would know, you know, you, 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 you as breed specialists would actually know, well, this is, a, you, you would almost look at it and say, I think this is going to be here on, you yeah. know, uh, 20, yeah. but we wouldn't, you know, yeah. well, I wouldn't, because, I, you know, I would go as far as to say, I don't think there's a single standard of male that is below 26 pounds in the ring at the moment. Yeah. Male or female. Really? Yeah. Really? Um, average, average in there is 22 pounds. And she is by far one of the smallest in the ring. She felt a bit heavy when I picked her up, but she's usually about 22 pounds. Take the opportunity in the hands on to pick up yeah, the standards. Yeah, I've got a small yeah. standard bitch I can bring in. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and when you see them in the ring, in, in particularly in the standards, and they look small, they're probably the ones that are right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and it is um, interesting when you actually find out what they wear. Well, it, is, it is as well, isn't it, with judges looking, the, the basic thing is it's fit for function. Absolutely. You know, if the dog is right in every other way and it's carrying a few extra pounds, that won't stop it from doing its job. Yeah. Unless yeah. it's too big to go down the hole. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That might be a good thing, it's though. <laughs> the original dachshund um, in Germany that the hunters bred were much bigger than us, but yeah. even now um, they, are, they are, they was 30 to 40 pounds, was quite common. Um, but we bred them, we want them smaller, and our breed standard is really clear as to what, what, what we want. Um, and the uh, thin and undernourished should be severely penalised, obviously is aimed probably more at the miniatures, but also applies to standards as well. We don't want to see any dogs being rewarded in the show ring that are too thin. Um, the next bit is standard in all breed standards. So any departure from the foregoing points, including desired body condition, should be considered a fault, and the seriousness of, um, with which the fault should be regarded should be in exact proportion to its degree and its effect upon the health and welfare of the dog. I don't think that could be clearer, okay? Uh, don't get het up about one thing, okay? Judge the dog as a whole, we're not fault judging. Um, we're looking at the dog as a whole, that's really important. Um, and if its shoulders are wrong, it can't do its job. If it's half an ounce over and its shoulders are correct and everything else is correct, it could still do its job, okay? Um, it's something just to take into account. And all male animals uh, should have two apparently normal testicles, fully descended, and you should be checking them. Miniature puppies, please be gentle, they can be quite tiny. Um, at that stage, um, and um, just be careful as you're, as you're checking them. Um, but most of them don't mind at all. Okay. Um, and interestingly, these are three images uh, from Sayer in 1939, uh, Daglesian in 1952, and our Breed Council one in 2010. It's not changed very much. No. Okay? 
So while some of the wording, particularly in Sayer, is, is a, a very much a discussion around the Greek standard and explaining, going through faults and, and virtues, actually what we think of as a really good example is not much different to, to what we want now. Um, and I will leave this on while having a copy, that's just showing us the bone structure underneath um, and there is a, you know, a bit of an explanation of the read standard around it. Okay. Any questions at all? Silence. <laughs> you must have done a good job. Yeah. 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 Yes. I, I hope you are, well, I know you're putting this talk out, which is absolutely great, but you're talking perfection. Yes. I mean, and this is what we all want. But when the judges get in the ring, they are not going to find perfection. I mean, like in any other breed. And it's a matter of weighing up what your preferential is really, within the breed. That is to do with weight and, and confirmation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in all breeds, the breed standard is your yeah. perfect dog, and that perfect dog doesn't yeah. exist. Um, and we're Project all trying to breed yeah. as close to our perfection as we can get. Um, and obviously, in a show dog, you also want temperament and character and show, showmanship and some that have perhaps more faults than others actually show themselves off to the best advantage and have an amazing handler who can hide um, some faults or a groom to perfection um, and um, you know, good uh, shoulders are very lacking in, in yes, all, they are. all of them yeah. at the moment. Um, so getting that the shoulder placement and the length of upper arm find that, um, you know, you do it really well. It is important. Yeah. And, and movement. Um, yeah. They are a breed, we should be moving. You know, they're a working hand and, um, you know, the exhibitors will moan, but please do keep sending them around the ring because that's when you'll see faults in top lines. Um, the drive needs to come from behind. They need to be well muscled. And if they're not well muscled, that you know they're not fit for function because they couldn't do their job. 